Good morning. Welcome to our online worship at St. John's Church in Florence. Thank you for joining us. We begin our worship in the words of the acclamation. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And And blessed be his his kingdom, kingdom, now and and forever. forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of hear the hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Keep, O Lord, your household, the church, in continual godliness, that through your protection it may be free from all adversities, and devoutly serve you in good works, to the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading comes from the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, beginning at the first verse. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright without within him. But the righteous shall live by his faith. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. A reading of Psalm 37. Fret not yourself because of the ungodly, neither be envious of those who are evildoers, for they shall soon be dried up like the grass and be withered even as the green herb. Put your trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and surely you shall be fed. Delight yourself in the Lord and he shall give you your heart's desire. Commit your way unto the Lord and put your trust in him and he shall bring it to pass. He shall make your righteousness as clear as the light and your just dealing as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not grieve yourself over the one who, whose way prospers, over the one who carries out evil counsels. Refrain from wrath and let go of anger. Fret not yourself, lest you be moved to do evil. For evildoers shall be rooted out. But those who wait patiently for the Lord, they shall inherit the land. Yet a little while, and the ungodly shall be clean gone. You shall look for their place, and they shall not be there. But the meek-spirited shall possess the land, and shall be refreshed with an abundance of peace. The ungodly plot against the just, and gnash at them with their teeth. The Lord shall laugh at them in scorn, for he sees that their day is coming. The ungodly have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay those who walk aright. Their sword shall go through their own heart and their bow shall be broken. The little that the righteous has is better than great riches of the ungodly. For the arms of the ungodly shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now, and will be forever. Amen.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory Glory to you, Lord Christ. And Jesus said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he is coming from the field, Come at once and recline at my table? Will he not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me, and dress properly, and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterwards you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, through your word today, through your presence with us, God, would you as you promise, make the impossible possible. Lord, would you teach us the ways of the kingdom that you have called us to be a part of? Lord, that we might expect, Father, for your grace to abound, for your forgiveness to abound, and for us, Lord, to abound. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I have to start today with an admission, and that is simply that parenting is hard. It's not a plea for help, I promise. I just have to admit it, it's not easy. If you have kids or if you've seen parents in the act of parenting, you probably have a a sense of this. Imagine if your kid were to ask you this question. What's the right answer exactly? What's a simple answer that, that, that your child could understand, a young child, if they were to ask you, if I clean my room, can I get some ice cream? What do you do with that? in the moment, right? You want to reward that good impulse or you you want to acknowledge that good impulse, right? That desire to to clean their room. That's something that you want to instill deep within that idea of responsibility, personal responsibility of that. But is it an act worthy of reward? Does it deserve some type of of, of grand uh, treat at the end? Or is it simply the expectation that you have? And how do you tell a three-year-old the difference? The parenting is hard. It's not easy. What we see today in our gospel from Luke is is Jesus engaging with his disciples in a similar sort of way. Like a parent who's trying to encourage a child's good initial impulse while also correcting them and, and broadening that child's understanding of what right action is, what right expectations are, Jesus uses three very vivid symbolic images uh, related to the the times in which he lived to get his point across. We see that in in Luke's gospel. We're in uh, chapter 17. If you want to follow along, uh, uh, he talks about first this, this, uh, this image of this millstone that is around the neck of a man who has been thrown into the sea, a very dramatic and and vivid image. And then he, he moves on and talks about this uprooted mulberry tree, this tree with this complex root system that are, that are established and it's, it's planted in the sea by the smallest inkling of faith. Again, another very, very vivid image that Jesus uses for his disciples. And then, and then finally, he talks about the unworthy servant, right, who does his duties as expected and he himself expects in return no extraordinary type of reward of any kind. These three vivid images Jesus uses to connect three themes, to to sort of line them up as they are to be understood in the kingdom of God. This idea of forgiveness, of faith, and of 
duty. You see, like the parent that is trying to encourage those good impulses, channel them into good and right actions and good and right expectations, Jesus teaches his disciples that forgiveness is the way of life. And I mean that in two different ways, right? It's the way that we receive life through our faith in him. But even more so, it's also the thing that defines the way in which we live. It defines our way of living. Forgiveness, Jesus says, is our stock in trade. It's the thing that we as disciples of him are to be known for. So let's just dive right in. Again, if you want to follow along, I encourage you to do so. Pick up the scriptures. We're in Luke chapter 17, and we're going to begin at the first verse and make our way through the first 10 verses. Jesus begins uh, this chapter and and this this dialogue with his disciples with with two warnings. Look at verses 1 and 2. Jesus said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. These little ones being the the disciples. So there are two warnings here. First, he says, be warned, temptation to sin is sure to come. It's coming. Don't be surprised when you see it. It will affect you. Temptation to sin is sure to come. But then he says, the second warning, be sure that it doesn't come through you. He says, there could be little that is worse than for you to be the tempter of one of these, my disciples, of one of those, your brothers or sisters in Christ. He says, be sure that temptation doesn't come from you. But how are the disciples to handle sin that comes from a brother? Knowing that this is to take place, a fellow disciple, what are the disciples to do about it? And so Jesus continues in verse 3, and he says, True repentance should be met with true forgiveness. True repentance should be met with true forgiveness. He hammers this point home. He says, pay attention to yourself. If, If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Jesus says, address the sin, and then if, if he repents, forgive him. But not only that, if his sin is against you, and it is repeated seven times in a day, and then seven times he repents and asks for forgiveness, then even still, you must forgive him. Now, Jesus is, is not in any way suggesting some type of, of cheap forgiveness, Right? As in uh, the kind that, that uh, we begin with as, as children, the, the kind that we sometimes revert to as adults. Right, One child smacks another, say, you're sorry, I'm sorry. Say, you forgive them, I forgive them. Okay, go on your way. That is in no way what Jesus is implying here. He's using this number seven not to imp- imply a, a lack of, of true repentance in the sinning person, but instead he's trying to imply the totality or the the completeness of forgiveness that the disciples of Jesus are to offer. When there is genuine and true repentance, there should be genuine and true forgiveness. This is the command that Jesus makes. The well of forgiveness should never run dry. Now, it seems that the disciples are somewhat alarmed by this, according to their reaction in verse 5. They they respond by saying, increase our faith. Now notice that Jesus doesn't condemn them in their response, right? To To their credit, the disciples recognize their need for Jesus to answer this command for complete and continual forgiveness. They see the importance of Jesus being central to that, right? They don't balk at the idea. They don't they don't say that this is not, not possible. It's an absolutely impossible for us to do this. There's no possible way that we could forgive this much and this often and this completely. They don't ask for the wrong thing, right? They don't ask for the, the tools of them to be able to do it for themselves. They ask for more Jesus. They say, give us more faith. Jesus, increase our trust in you. Help us trust you more so that we can somehow manage to follow your difficult commands for our lives. 
And so to this, Jesus gives a two-part response. We see it in verse 6, and then we see it in the parable in verses 7 through 10. And Jesus, in his response, is encouraging as well as correcting his disciples. He's trying to reframe their thinking on forgiveness from something that is practically impossible to do to something that is not only possible, but that is actually expected. You see, the apostles seem to think that some sort of great faith is needed to follow Jesus's command to forgive completely and continually. And were this to be the case, then then you could safely assume a person with such extraordinary reserves of forgiveness would, when, when all has been forgiven, would then deserve as equally extraordinary of a reward, right? When someone goes above and beyond, we acknowledge it. We celebrate it. We try to encourage that kind of behavior, right? We give medals for extraordinary heroism in the line of duty. We give scholarships to students with extraordinary academic or athletic talents and abilities. We have incentives in the workplace for this very reason, right? To encourage the employees to go above and beyond. Meet this quota and you can earn this vacation. Work these extra shifts and get paid this extra amount. So let's look at Jesus's response. This is what the disciples are thinking as they come to Jesus, saying, Jesus, increase our faith. Let's see how Jesus both encourages them and corrects their hearts towards right action and right expectation. So first, we see in verse 6. The Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Now, in his response, Jesus doesn't clearly acknowledge this quantity of faith that the disciples do or don't have, but he does very clearly comment on the potency of faith, right? He says a little goes a long way. He might be implying that the disciples don't have enough if we were to think about it in these sort of quantitative terms, but he's definitely saying that they don't need much, right? The mustard seed was known by them. Colloquially, it's the smallest seed. The mulberry tree is a a tall sort of fig-like tree. It has this complex root system. The idea of this little amount of faith being able to do something as miraculous as that, to tell a tree of such stature to be uprooted and then to go do the odd thing of being planted in the ocean, in the sea, I should say. What Jesus is saying is it doesn't take much faith in me for you to be able to do the impossible. So yes, Jesus is encouraging his disciples. Yes, faith is what you need, but but he doesn't stop there. He says, I'm not asking you to do the impossible. I'm asking you to do for others what I, in fact, am here to do for you. So when we put our faith in Jesus, we are staking our lives on the promise that our genuine repentance is met by his genuine forgiveness. All right? And because of the cross, we know that this is not just some sort of outlandish hope, some childlike dream or wish, but it's one that has actually been proven to be true, proven to be sound, proven to be worthy of withstanding and upholding our hope in our lives. See, Jesus demonstrates in any number of ways that he has the power to forgive sins. He casts out demons. He pronounces forgiveness while performing physical healings just so we could understand what's taking place spiritually. But it's the cross. It's the cross that that we see the power of Jesus to forgive applied for you and for me. You see, it's when Jesus is placed on the cross by our very hands, that Luke records Jesus saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see, his forgiveness is so genuine that he actually offers it before we know to even ask for it. It is an expectation that we would understand, and that through understanding that we would repent, and through repentance that we would ask for forgiveness. And he says, yes, yes, forgiveness is yours. See, it's on the cross that we see Jesus not only has the power to forgive, but that he has the desire to see it through. And so that leads us to the second part 
uh, verses 7 through 10, not only is complete forgiveness possible, but it is actually expected for those who walk with Jesus, who walk in the kingdom of God. See, Jesus uses this story of an unworthy servant to illustrate his point. And as foreign as it may be to us now, we know from the way that Jesus phrases this question that the expected answer is no. Jesus isn't encouraging anyone to be inconsiderate or or to be rude. He's describing a societal expectation in the relationship between a servant and his master. Look at verse 7 to to see what I mean. Jesus says, Will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? The expected answer is surely not. Think of it in a modern context. Should an employee expect such special treatment for putting in a normal day's work? If he reports in at lunchtime that he's on track for the day, should his boss say, great work, why don't you take the afternoon off? I'll take it from here. We would say, of course not. Of course that would not be the expectation. And so with this story, Jesus resets the, 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 excuse me, the disciples' expectations on forgiveness. He brings it down this idea of forgiveness from this extraordinary feat that requires extraordinary reserves or extraordinary effort to this common, everyday, run-of-the-mill expectation. He says this is the expectation for disciples of Christ. Forgiveness is our stock in trade. It is the thing that we have in abundance, that we are characterized for giving, for having, and for offering freely. We forgive because we have been forgiven, and we have been forgiven abundantly, and so we forgive abundantly. And we make no claims for special reward because we're simply participating in the kingdom of God in the way that we are intended to. We are not worthy of some type of special recognition or extraordinary reward. We are simply offering to others what we ourselves have been offered in great abundance. But you know what's truly amazing? See, the very thing that the disciples cannot fathom, right? That the servant would be served by the master. Will any, will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at, tab- at table? The disciples are thinking, surely not. And yet this is the exact thing that Jesus promises, that we see fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. This is exactly the extraordinary act that Jesus promises when he says that he will come again. Luke records Jesus saying in chapter 12, again talking to the disciples in parable, he says, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. Be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service, the master will. And he will have them recline at table. And he will come and serve them. You see, friends, the extraordinary act of forgiveness belongs to God. And he has called us into it. And he equips us to give it. And it requires no great amount of faith in him, no great reserve of will or virtue in us. It is simply how we are called to live and breathe as we interact with one another in this world. It is how we are to be known. See, for disciples of Jesus, forgiveness is the way of life. It's the way in which he gives us life as he calls out our forgiveness from the cross where we place him. And yet, at the same time, it's also our stock in trade. It is the thing that we are known for having, the thing that we are known for giving freely. It is the thing that characterizes us as the children of God himself. Amen. respond to the word of God read and proclaims the faith of God's people in the word of the Nicene Creed, saying together, 
I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead. His kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Mighty and ever-living God, we are taught by your holy word to offer prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all people. We humbly ask you mercifully to receive our prayers. Inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all who confess your holy name may agree in the truth of your holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that you will lead the nations of the world in the way of righteousness and so guide and direct their leaders, especially President Biden, Governor McMaster, and Mayors Myers Irvin that your people may enjoy the blessings of freedom and peace. Grant that our leaders may impartially administer justice, uphold integrity and truth, restrain wickedness and vice, and protect true religion and virtue. And we commend to thy gracious care and keeping all those who serve the common good, especially our military, those in law enforcement, first responders, health care workers, and all those who go into harm's way to protect us, to defend us, and to rescue us from danger. We pray especially for Joel Billings, Hartwell Bryant, T.J. Carpenter, Jonathan Carroll, Alan Kopp, Caleb Fleck, Chloe Fleck, and Colin Fleck, Matt Harvey, Brandon Johnson, Daniel Lamb, Andrew McCarrier, Peter McCann, Paul Miller, Tom Miller, Mike Shaw, Michael Sims, John Taft, Ben Thornton, Stephen Turner, Ricky Tyner, Peter Warren, and their families. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Prosper, we pray, all those who proclaim the gospel of your kingdom throughout the world. Give grace, Heavenly Father, to all bishops, priests, and deacons, and especially to your servants, Archbishop Foley Beach and Bishop Chip Edgar, that by their life and teaching they may proclaim your true and life-giving word and rightly and duly administer your holy sacraments. And to all your people, give your heavenly grace, especially to this congregation, that with reverent and obedient hearts we may hear and receive your holy word and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask you in your goodness, O Lord, to comfort and sustain all who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially Mary Chapman, Aubrey Crawford, Henry Dixon, Leanna Driggers, Lynn Gilbert, Harry Greenleaf, Mary Hepburn, Steve Horn, Maggie Hurst, Eric Kellogg, Andrea Kelly, Nellie Laney, Kelly McAllister, Lynn Mary, Luana Miller, Joanne Morgan, Shot Paget, Susan Sensony, Trey Suggs, and Robert White. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remember before you all your servants who have departed this life in your faith in fear especially Francis Kelly, mother of Andrew Kelly, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we ask you to give us grace to follow the good examples of St. John and all your saints, that we may share with them in your heavenly kingdom. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, our governor, whose glory is in all the world, we commend to your merciful care the people and government of Ukraine, that being guided by your providence, they may dwell secure in your peace. Grant to their leaders in all in authority, wisdom and strength to know and to do your will. Fill them with the love of truth and righteousness and make them ever mindful of their calling to serve their people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life to the honor and glory of thy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in His great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to Him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to Him. Come unto me, all who travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is a true saying, worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. Friends, the peace of the Lord be always with you and, and also, also with you. Well, good morning again. It's a joy to be with you in worship, even from a distance. Thank you for joining us this morning. We've got a few announcements for you. Um, first off, I want to say that we've had a couple of our uh, key fall events that have started or kicked off this past week. We had our first faith formation class on Sunday morning. That class is in between the services. It starts at 1015 in the back in the fellowship hall. We are spending six weeks, five more now, walking through the story of everything, the story of the world of creation in, as God has taught it to us in scripture, explaining how his plan from beginning to end is fulfilled and finding our place within that story. So this week we talked about creation, um, this Sunday, as you're watching the service now, we'll be talking about um, the fall and the entry of sin and evil into the world. Um, it's not too late to join us for the last four sessions, though, as we continue the story through the grand consummation of God's purposes as all things are restored to him. I encourage you to join us for that. We had our first parish picnic, or uh, not parish picnic, um, our first parish evening events this past Wednesday night. It was um, really a great success, had a good crowd, had a great time talking about faith in time, talking about how this church calendar, the church year, is a useful tool to shape our discipleship and again to help us find our place in the story of God. Um, if you were part of that, if you joined us, thank you for coming. It was a great joy, great fun. If not, I encourage you to come to the next one. We'll give you a heads up as it approaches. It'll be towards the end of November and we'll be making Advent wreaths as a, as a way to prepare our hearts for the season of Advent and to help us in our homes to observe that season, to draw our hearts to the right waiting for Christ to come again. Should be a great time uh, then in November. 
a couple of great opportunities for mission that our church is already a part of, but wanted to invite you to be a part of too. The first is the East Florence Missions. Okay, Fryman, our deacon coordinates that mission um, or our involvement with it. We provide a meal to the children of East Florence on the second Monday of each month. And we're tasked with that through May. So we're looking for individuals and families to sign up to cook that meal, um, to bring it to the church and, so that Kay can take it to um, those children that we serve in East Florence. So if you're interested in that, I encourage you to reach out to Kay. We've got a lot of opportunities in this next, the rest of the fall and into the spring. And um, would love to have you be a part of this ministry that St. John's has taken on and been a part of before. Um, it's going to be a great joy there. Um, and second, Meals on Wheels. Uh, you may have heard of this one before as well. It, it is an incredible ministry that provides meals to homebound folks around the county, some of whom are homebound for age or for health reasons. Um, and our contact person for that is Craig McKenzie. If you'd like to be involved in that, there are a lot of different ways to be involved on Meals and Wheels. It's not just delivering meals, but preparing them and packing them. Um, if you want to learn more about how you or your family might get involved in that mission, um, reach out to Craig McKenzie. He would love to tell you more about it. Um, with that, let me, uh, I'll conclude our announcements with our birthdays and anniversaries for the week. So happy birthday this week to Eddie Buckhouse and Clara Wilcox to Emma Johnston, and to Harry Canty, Alan Cossey, Carter Ellington, Katie Rogers, James Wyatt Arthur, and Woods Lyles. Happy birthday to all of you this week, and then our anniversaries, Tiffany and John Carter Ellington, very uh, happy anniversary, and congratulations to you two, and to Kay, and Jean Fryman as well. Congratulations on your anniversary. Let's conclude our worship now in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Amen. Praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Continuing together. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised that your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia, alleluia. alleluia.